Our speakers today are myself, I'm the VP of Marketing at Playbook. Eric Graves is our VP of Product Development and Technology. David Paulson is our CEO. In terms of agenda, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to Playbook the company. I know some of you have heard, already heard this, so I'll try to make it quick. I'll hand over the webinar to Eric and David. Eric will be leading the discussion, and David will offer support. Eric's going to cover the interactive format of the webinar, uh, where we left, left off from the last webinar. Um, he's going to talk about small information batches, decentralized project management, how Playbook supports these principles. We'll then have a Q&A session. And we'd be really appreciative, once again, if you'd answer that one question poll at the end of the webinar. So about Playbook, um, the solution was developed with a lot of effort over a long period of time of solving a very complex problem, how to deliver high quality innovative products faster, a problem which all of you are very much involved in. Uh, the methods we are going to discuss were developed out of solving this problem with over 60 companies, both large blue chip clients and smaller startups. This environment created the really perfect environment for rapidly learning about what worked and what didn't in new product development. What all the companies had in common was they wanted to deliver to market faster and deliver higher quality and more innovative products. However, all the companies suffered the same problems. 90% of their products were late to market. So this is why we're here today to discuss some of the principles that combat, combat these problems and improve product development success. So with that, I'll hand it over to Eric Graves, our expert on making product development systems run faster. Thanks, Alyssa. Hello again, everybody. Uh, so today we're going to do the webinar as kind of a hybrid approach. The first webinar was interactive. We had open mic pretty much the whole time. Uh, the last webinar, webinar two, was not. It was the opposite. It was just me the whole time. Um, this time we're going to try a hybrid approach. We're going to have three sessions when we're going to open the mics and uh, try to start some discussion open Q&A, and uh, when we get to those, we'll, we'll notify you at that time. We're going to unmute everyone. Uh, you can mute yourself using the little icon there. And if we hear background noise, we'll be able to tell where that's coming from, and we'll mute that person, and uh, then we'll mute everybody again until we get to the next session. And again, anytime as you're thinking of them, as they come up, just type any questions you have in the questions window, and we'll get to those when we get to those sessions. Okay, so just uh, picking up where we left off, so you remember in the first webinar we presented a current reality tree showing a lot of the largest issues slowing down product development teams today. We made the point that the problems are all interrelated, and there are reinforcing loops here. So if we only solve some of the problems, we're really only going to accelerate the projects a little bit. Our challenge is really to solve all of them in order to drastically accelerate our product development. In the first three webinars of the series, again, we focus on these problems on the left. And in the fourth webinar, we'll turn our attention to the problems on the right. In the first webinar, we also looked at some typical economic sensitivities, specifically the cost of delay of an average new product development project being about a half million dollars per month, or $25,000 per business day on average. So this indicates the large opportunity which relies in focusing more on project speed, maybe a little less on project expenses. And that's a theme that will recur again here today. Uh, ultimately, we saw that the leading indicator of the health and speed of our product development system are the sizes of the queues in it. Uh, we see that the long durations of our tasks and our projects is largely the, the result of wait or queue time, uh, follow, you know, a long wait or queue time followed by a longer than necessary execution time on our tasks. By reducing the queue time and the execute time, we can accelerate our projects. We do this by managing demand, using pull at the resource level first and at the system level second, eliminating task buffers, which reduces multitasking. We also quantified it by recognizing that every hour we work on an incorrect priority or uh, work via multitasking or not really recognizing what's really critical and what, what isn't. Every hour we spend on that incorrect priority delays the end of our project by one hour. Uh, we also recognize that the key aspects of the pull system at the resource level, as we see here on the right, are clear and correct priorities determined in part by project and milestone priority, and then the criticality of the task on that project. OK, when we left off, we made the point also that to achieve fast projects, which we can also have great confidence in, we requires two things. 
one, a more predictive model of the project, and two, more control over the system and the project itself. In order to achieve these, uh, we require a few things, such as good plans, managed risks, uh, measured or high, you know, high availability of our resources, or at least measured availability of our resources, and project buffers instead of task buffers, implemented in a way that gives us a better control mechanism for our projects. In today's webinar, we're going to examine really the high impact of reducing batch size in our information flow. We're going to discuss the batches and new product development, including requirements batches, plan updates and status batches, and other, other batches we have in product development, which really slow ourselves down with. Uh, secondly, we'll look at the key enabler of these, many of these methods, uh, decentralized project management. So let's get the batch sizes. Uh, start off. One about, I want to start off by defining what a batch is. Uh, make the point that it's a group of items going through a process or a single step of the process together. Uh, these items are sometimes batched because they're dependent on each other, but more often they're batched because we think it's going to save us some time and money by doing so. Unfortunately, as we'll see, batches often have the opposite effect of extending projects and increasing the overall cost. When we say debatch, we mean to break up that group of items into smaller groups, put the smaller groups through the process separately. Uh, the ultimate debatch is to separate the item completely into individual pieces, producing a single piece flow where each item lives and progresses independently from all the others. A couple of notes. Uh, sometimes after debatching our items, different items can go through different processes, which accelerates the overall process. For example, pulling one drawing out of a batch of drawings on a standard ECO and putting it on a fast track ECO instead. And when we do batch items, they can follow their own path to completion, independent of the rest. This is generally results in a shorter, faster path than the one they would travel as part of a batch. Another quick example here, uh, two people traveling together in the same car, and that's a batch. And one person may need to stop for coffee or the bathroom, the other may not. But batching them together slows down everyone's progress. Everybody has to go the way one person in that batch wants to go. Uh, in this case, the only reason to put the people together, if the only reason to put people together is to save on resources and only drive one car, the, the people in the batch are independent. Uh, if they need to talk about the meeting, they're going to develop a presentation or something along the way. They are dependent on each other. Now, we have a mix of both of these in NPD and everyday life, and we'll discuss this. Uh, one more quick note, uh, very often the items that we're talking about here, especially in hardware development, they change from one type of item to a different type of item as they're going through the process. Or some items spawn different items at different steps in the process. For example, in NPD, we might start out with items as requirements, some of which spawn risk items, most of which spawn part items, and there are builds and tests and so on. This changing of items from one form to another as we go through the process is an important complication of hardware development as opposed to software development where the items really largely stay the same. A feature or a bug or a user story really going all the way through the process. Okay. Uh, so we're going to discuss many of the different types of items and processes in NPD and how debatching can accelerate our projects. But first, let's look at an everyday life example of batches. We'll look at some cookies. So once they become dollops of dough, they're really independent. Each cookie could bake by itself just fine, but we put them together on the same cookie sheet and bake the whole sheet of cookies at the same time. Uh, in other cases, like maybe drawings on an ECO, they might be related to each other enough that batching them together is necessary or helpful, um, but in most often cases, they're, they're really independent, like the cookies are. Uh, so some Batches are necessary and beneficial. You know, in the case of our cookies, if we had to bake them one or two at a time, and if we only had one oven and we can't open it to add or remove any cookies without ruining the batch that's already there, it's going to take a lot longer to process 12 cookies. But if we can add or remove from the oven while some are still cooking, or if we have multiple ovens, then we can process the batches in parallel and we save a lot of time by debatching. Um, even if we can't process all of the batches in parallel by debatching, we can get earlier information about how well it's working because the first or earliest cookies get baked earlier. We'll see that. Uh, in 
both the cases of earlier feedback and earlier completion time. I mean, time is money, as we've discussed in the cost of delay. The earlier we get done or get the information we need, the more valuable it is and the more money we're going to make. But there are costs to debatching, too. You know, sometimes batches save us time and money. But sometimes batches cost us more than they save us, and sometimes they cost us a lot more than they save us. So to see the difference, let's map out this simple process on the timeline. So here we are looking at our process of putting our dollops of dough onto a cookie sheet, baking them all together for 15 minutes, then taking the cookies back off the sheet again. I made the, uh, the taking the cookies off of the sheet take a little longer than it would really take just to make things more visible. I notice our first cookie in this batch comes out at minute 22, and our last cookie really isn't complete until minute 24. There's one you know, benefit to larger batches, and we're not sometimes they're big enough to make the batch worth doing. Basically, batches, larger batches reduce the expense cost per item called the transaction cost. Now, the transaction cost in this case, including the oven as a resource and the baker as a resource, is two minutes per cookie. Uh, when the items in different batches cannot be processed in parallel, you know, batches Batching them can accelerate the completion date. You know, we talked about that. Um, but in this case, we're going to assume that we can add our cookies to the oven as you know, while some are already baking. So here in the lower image, we batch our cookies in little batches of two. We place them on the little cookie sheets and add them to the oven as soon as we're ready with each batch of two. So as we can see here, uh, we get the first cookie completed in about 17 minutes. It's five minutes early than the first cookie in the batched up scenario. And very close to the minimum of 16 minutes, we would see with single piece flow, 15 minute bake time and a little time to put the cookie on and take it off. Notice the last cookie in the debatch scenario is completed around minute, around minute 22. You know, a good two and a half minutes earlier than the last cookie in the batched scenario. So, uh, you know, batching basically creates queue time. You know, all of this empty white space up in here, that's queue time. And that queue time translates to the completion dates on our tasks and our projects. And that queue time, that delay, has a cost. Maybe not in the case of cookies. The cost of delay of some cookies may be fairly low, but in the cost of delay of our projects, it's fairly high. And that cost of delay can make a big difference. Uh, transaction cost in this scenario is higher. So, you know, it's two and a half, almost three minutes per cookie uh, when we look across the, the baker and the oven and how long they're being used. So acceleration of a few minutes in the cookies, you know, the early cookies and the late cookies is great, but there are even bigger reasons to debatch, and that's to get earlier feedback. So let's say there's a problem with the recipe. You know, it's the first time we've ever baked this type of cookie. We live at high altitude like I do. And we haven't figured out really how to modify the recipe in order to get them to come out well. Um, so say we could recognize that within the minute or two of them being in the oven. In our big batch scenario, by the time we figure out that there's a problem, it's too late. All of the items, you know, that whole pool of resources, all of the materials basically scrap. We have to start all over, get new materials, spend more money, and it's going to take us longer to finish. In the case of the debash scenario, we get the feedback back in here somewhere. We haven't used all of the dough yet. There's plenty of time to hold back, add some more flour or whatever it takes to make it come out right. Have a good chance of getting some cookies without having to spend any more money on it and getting them a lot faster. So I mean, that's really the biggest value to debatching is the earlier feedback we get. And we're going to talk about that a, little, you know, a whole lot more in this discussion. Um, so in general, when transaction costs are high for each item and the cost of delay is low, or the items can't be processed in parallel anyway, or the probability of errors, unknown errors, is very small, really it can be better to batch things up. However, when items can be processed in parallel, or especially when the, the feedback, there's feedback to be acquired from somewhere downstream in the process, or the cost of delay of our items are very high, so there are big benefits to debatching. And this is almost always the case in product development. 
is almost always feedback to be gained. Uh, and by debatching and getting something downstream earlier. So uh, just mention the holding cost. We call this uh, the, time, the queue time and the delays in our completion dates are is called holding cost. Holding cost itself is a function of the delay itself and the cost of delay in, in dollars per unit time. So for example, cost of delay of a project is $25,000 a day. If we're delaying our project four days, the holding cost is $100,000 that batch that delayed our project by four days. We see that graphed out on this curve. When the transaction cost is this line here. It goes down as we increase batch size, and with low batch sizes, the transaction cost can be pretty high. Uh, the holding cost, on the other hand, goes up as batch size increases. And the slope of that line is the cost of delay of that uh, object or that project. Um, so the, the whole transaction costs, those are easy to see. You know, we, that's why we create bigger batches, is because we get this impression that we're going to reduce our transaction costs. You know, we can see and feel the time we spend, and we want to reduce that time. The holding costs, on the other hand, are a lot harder to see, so we don't often realize they're there, and we keep increasing batch sizes until we spend more on holding costs than we save in, in transaction costs. Um, so the holding cost on the curve on the right represents the time, uh, the cost of delay due to additional queue time plus the cost of delay due to feedback, delayed feedback, and both of these are very costly, especially when the cost of delay is high. And there are other additional issues with batch, batches create, and we'll look at those momentarily. But first, before we get to, to that, I want to open up the mics. And let's uh, gather some examples from you guys of what uh, what kind of example batches you can think of in everyday life and in, in new product development. So at this time, we'll go ahead and unmute the microphones. If you're in a, in a loud place, please go ahead and mute yourself. Uh, Alyssa, can you go ahead and unmute the attendees, please? Muted. So, Eric, our, our problem is the biggest batch that we're this year at Windsor is the uh, gathering of market requirements. We, we don't take any steps toward uh, realizing a concept until uh, an exhaustive market requirement batch has been completed. And the big cost of that. Uh, yeah, thanks for mentioning that. Uh, that's a great example, and actually uh, we're going to talk about that here in a minute because it's it's a big glaring example of how long it delays for ourselves. What other ideas you guys have? Or, you know, where are the places where we're creating batches in product development or in everyday life?
in the everyday life example, you know, we got the football game ends and the big batch people all rush to the doors. We got a bus arriving at Denny's. Uh, we got cars entering the highway. Those are great examples that uh, of everyday life. Product development. The examples are really, really plentiful. Um, the one that was just mentioned was the batch that we have between requirements and development. We build up a big batch of requirements before we hand them off to development. There are many others. Drawing a release, design reviews, reviews with suppliers and stuff, uh, design build test loops, and the big one we're going to talk about really more today is uh, task project status updates. That's the one we're here to look at most closely. But we will look at, look at all of these. Eric, we did uh, receive a question during that period through the chat window. Do you okay. want to answer that now? Yeah. Uh, what Kirk, is, what's the question? Yeah, so they were saying that um, you'd mentioned that uh, batching things uh, slows down the uh, slows them all down to the slowest common denominator. Is it possible to batch things based on their speed through the system? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, yeah, if you if you can find ways to batch things together so that they can go almost as quickly or almost as quickly as they were uh, in a completely independently one single piece flow debatch scenario, then yeah, that's great. You know, get it done quickly and save a little on transaction costs, and that's that's definitely the way to go. So, for example, we used our um, you know example of fast track ECO and the long track ECO, the regular ECO. We have a few parts that we can put on the fast track and get those out and done and taken care of, and leave a few you know fewer behind for the long regular ECO. Yeah, that's fine. Two batches is okay. Um, okay, and there's one more comment on this uh, question here about examples of uh, batches, and they said milestone decisions at phase gates. Right, phase gates, big batches at phase gates. I should have added that to my list. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, yeah, and I, I mean, we could go on for hours about phase gates, but uh, yeah, every time you hold up something while some while other things catch up to it, you're creating a batch. You're establishing, you know, we can't move forward on this until that other thing arrives too. And we just force batches which slows down our entire process. Um, that's why a lot of a lot of companies who have phase gates, if you go ask the engineers if they move forward before everything's approved and the phase phase gate meeting has been had. Most of the time, they'll say yes because it really makes sense to do so, and they can they can just feel that. Okay, well let's keep trucking. Um, so one more example here of uh, feedback. I'll I'll use the supplier review, you know, or really it's any of these design reviews uh, batch. You know, for example, we may batch decide that we want to have one review with our supplier or one review with our team once the design is pretty much all done. You know, we batch up all of this design information and we try to deliver it in one hour there at the end of the project. Instead of spacing it out over a few three or four hours, maybe different times in the middle of the project. Problem is by the time we get to the big batch at the end review, it's probably too late to easily incorporate some of the feedback we're going to get. And the result of getting this information late is a more costly product. We end up uh, having to spend more on our parts than we'd like, or we have to, you know, suffer the expenses, the long and costly delays of the changes that we try to incorporate later. Um, we really would have been better off having the engineer spend a couple hours, few hours, to batching that information, passing it along earlier, and getting that and getting the feedback early. So, a million examples of that. We're going to dig in this more. And really, the big one is the delay in feedback. That's this one down here. Uh, there are other problems. Notice uh, there's an increase in queue time. Uh, there's just maybe three or four other pro three three to six other problems. There's that increase in queue time. There's an increase in the utilization of the resource, and then parallel processing again. So to talk about queue time and the inbox outbox outbox queues, let's use the example of an ECO with 10 drawings. So you receive an ECO with 10 drawings to review. 
what do you do? You look at drawing number one. In the meantime, while you're looking at drawing number one, drawing number two through ten are sitting there doing nothing, waiting in a queue. And you look at drawing number one, you put it off to the right in your outbox, pick up, start looking at drawing number two. Number one is sitting there in the outbox doing nothing, waiting for the rest of the items to catch up to it. And drawing number three through ten is still sitting there in the inbox doing nothing while you're looking at drawing number two. And so on and so on. And all of that time that these items sit waiting for the other items in the batch to catch up translates really directly to our the completion dates on our tasks and the completion dates on our projects. So these other problems are uh, increased utilization of the resource to 100%. Uh, it keeps us from parallel processing when we could. And that includes you know, getting out to launch and starting to make money uh, while we're waiting for the other, for example, products in the family to get completed. Um, and you know, last but certainly not least are the biggest delayed feedback. So let's look at these a little bit more closely. So we're going to look at the 100% utilization factor. Uh, this is, again, the cumulative flow diagram like we saw in the second webinar about queues. Uh, when we deliver a batch to a processor step, we send the utilization of that resource to 100% until the batch has been processed. You know, for example, here's our football game letting out. Everyone arrives at the exit gates or the exits from the parking lot at the same time, fills up those resources until everybody's been processed. Another example, a batch of 10 cars entering a busy highway at the same time. It's a big batch, loads the system right there, and causes a slowdown. Another example is NPD. You know, I'm sure you guys have experienced this. We get way to the end of the project, and we release all of our drawings at the same time at the end of the project. At, you know, what ends up happening is all those ECOs flood the inboxes of document control and all the approvers, and a lot of those drawings wait while there are other drawings being processed. There's three, really three major problems this call, causes. Um, one is the high queue state. You know, it takes a long time to clear. Any drawings showing up for release after that big batch goes in take a lot longer than usual to be processed. And even a simple drawing that should go very quickly very often doesn't when it shows up behind a big batch. You know, this longer than expected task you know, it causes variability. It is variability. You know, which often has that ripple effect into the project. Part orders delayed, builds are delayed, tests are delayed. You know, the result is turbulence and scrambling and extra work for people and stress. You know, avoiding this is a matter of reducing the batch size. And the positive effect of smaller batch sizes is one of the reasons why we have metering lights and the highway on ramps. You know, most of you, I'm sure, have experienced that, where you have to sit at this light before and, and enter the highway one or two cars at a time. You know, by with the metering lights, you know, the traffic can absorb these little pieces a lot more easily, and they don't cause a major slowdown there. Overall, because it doesn't cause a clog, it doesn't cause a slowdown, and it keeps the system flowing smoothly, everybody gets home more quickly, even the people who have to wait at the lights. And back to our ECO example. You know, if an approver receives a batch of one or two drawings to review, you know, it's easier to fit a review in the few minutes they have in a given day. If we dump a big batch of drawings for that uh, reviewer, you know, they're going to wait sometimes until they have more time in their day. They're going to put it off until there's more room for it. This just causes more turbulence, more delays in the system, just because we decided to batch things up. So. That's that's all bad stuff, but you know, here let's talk about what what we could be doing and could be gaining with parallel processing. Here's that example that came up of you know in in the transfer of of requirements to a development team. You know, the development team they don't want to they want to save a little time. They don't want to have to work to meet requirements that are just going to change later. So as a result, the typical waterfall approach you know, arrives and we batch our requirements up and try to get them all right before we hand them off to development. Now, say with, once we finish our requirements and hand them off, the development of that finished set of requirements takes about this long. Now, if we do batch the requirements, so we can deliver some of them to development early and get started on them early. If there is no rework, for every day earlier that we started our development, is a day earlier we're going to launch. 
to the tune of about $25,000 a day, the average product. If we know which requirements are still in flux, you know, we can often architect the product to accommodate these requirements changes later with really little or no rework. A lot of these requirements, change, you know, changes we can recognize aren't going to have a big impact, what color we're going to color it or where we're going to put the logo or something, you know, what we're going to put on the label. All of this stuff that we can delay for later and get development started earlier and not have a big impact, that's a day-for-day -day improvement by debatching those requirements and letting go of some of them earlier. Now, of course, changing requirements sometimes, usually, often causes some rework, especially if we weren't expecting those requirements to change. And in this case, it becomes a trade-off of the rework costs against the value of releasing earlier. It's really the cost of this extra rework against the value you know, of the gain we would receive by being to market earlier. You know, it's really only in the case where there's 100% rework and we really have to start this development all over again or we were going to release at the same time. And that's almost never the case. You know, every hour we spend early learning something that we don't have to spend later, relearning that same thing is an hour earlier that we're going to complete this project. 100% you know, rework just doesn't happen. So um, really ultimately the trade-off becomes you know, how much rework is there against how, how much time are you going to save? You know, are you going to get done earlier by starting earlier? And how much is each of that time? Is the time here cost and how much is the time here pay? And doing that trade-off. So you know, obviously the, the parallel processing enabled by debatching can help a lot, especially when there's not a lot of rework work involved. But debatching helps even more when we have to get our items downstream in order to get feedback about what we're doing upstream. What if there's a problem in these requirements? When do we find that out? You know, this feedback, the feedback is absolutely the biggest piece of debatching, the biggest value to debatching. So here's a picture. We hold the requirements until they're all done. We hand them off to development. And development comes back saying some of those requirements can't be met or they built their prototype and they showed it to customers and we found out we really missed the mark. We, the customers don't really like what we came up with for requirements. Every day that we spent refining these requirements and delaying that feedback is a delay that translates directly to our completion date. So by debatching those requirements, we get that feedback earlier. We get development start earlier. We get the feedback earlier about what requirements need to change. We ultimately complete the project earlier. And whenever there's feedback from downstream, which is going to change what we are doing upstream, debatching to get that feedback earlier is absolutely huge. Especially in the uncertain world of product development, there's almost always some feedback to be acquired when we get downstream. And this feedback is, again, absolutely the most valuable aspect to reducing our batch sizes. And there's a million examples, and you know, we could go through all of them, where we try to save ourselves or other people a little bit of time by batching up the work, because we can really only see these transition, these transaction costs. We can't really see the cost of delay or, or really the holding costs involved. So as a result, you know, most of our companies, we work ourselves out into this area of the curve. We're way out here on the far upper right. So all we need to really do is reduce our batch size to get down, and we're going to improve our overall costs and the time it takes to complete our projects. Um, notice the shape of the curve. It's a U shape which indicates we don't really have to be perfect in our sizing of the batch. If we get somewhere somewhere in this neighborhood of the U-shape, close enough. I notice also on the left, the, the slope gets pretty steep, pretty fast. You get to where we're spending really all of our time on transaction costs, it gets pretty obvious. So we can just safely reduce our batch sizes, work our way down the queue, and until we really hit this wall of transaction costs, we're probably doing ourselves some good. There's a million places to do this, uh, but we're only going to really kind of dig in to the one more today about the batches and our task status and project status updates. On the next webinar, uh, we'll look at some of the other examples, for example, the, the impact of reducing batch sizes in our design-build test loops. So uh, before we get into really the, the batches in our 
project and status updates. I'd like to go ahead and uh, see if we do have any more questions. We do. We are running a little bit late, so um, I guess if we if we have a question, let's answer it, and then we'll defer the kind of open session until we get to the end again. Are there are there any more questions, Tiff? Yeah. So the question about um, batches. If we are creating batches that don't impact the overall project time, are those necessarily bad? If they don't impact the project time, you know, if they don't create a delay of any sort, uh, and they only save you on transaction costs, then no, those are not necessarily bad. Um, the examples where that occurs, I can't think of very many. So it'd be um, interesting to see in what cases that you're thinking of. Um, maybe it's just because I see the costs in the batches, and I see uh, all, all the many times where they're slowing us down, uh, and it's clouding the times when they're not. But uh, I see a lot of cases where they just slow us down. All right, well, let's keep trucking. We'll, um, we'll open up the floor for discussion however later, assuming we have time. And uh, we'll need to get back into that a little bit more. So as we jump in, I want to ask one quick question. So what's the product of product development? Anybody know what are we producing, actually? A lot of people think maybe it's the product or it's profit. But really, if you look at it, it's information. It's all about the information. It's all about the knowledge we create and how quickly we can generate translate and transfer this information. And here again, looking at these examples of NPD batches, and we look at it, we see all of these are just different flavors of information. And when we notice, you know, these are all just information and the value of information. The more time that goes on between today, basically the later that we identify, we generate this information and get it processed, the less valuable that information is because it costs us more to incorporate, or we're more limited in what we can incorporate. You know, it's not, you know, it's pretty pretty well known that the cost of change increases over time. It's pretty obvious when we're talking about long time spans. You know, we get to the end of a project, and there's learn of some issue late in the project. You know, certainly it increases our costs in order to be able to incorporate those changes. We've got parts, maybe we're already, we've already ordered production quantities of those parts. Or you know, worse, you know, we find out late that our customer doesn't really like some of the features we thought they would love. We don't have time to incorporate those changes, and the costs appear in our reduced sales volumes and market share. Either way, they're all big costs, especially when they're late. But even on time, small time scales, and even earlier in the project, there's still big losses if by getting late information. For example, uh, so we didn't recognize. Uh, you know, we didn't see that there was a blockage in a critical task for one day sometime in the project. What's that cost us? Well, it cost us one day worth of delay on the project. If we didn't had a critical resource working on the wrong priorities for one day and that information wasn't getting to us, we didn't get the information that that resource was working on the wrong priorities, every day that that goes by costs us one more day on our project. The whole point faster, earlier information is more valuable in all cases and at all times in product development projects. And debatching is an important way to achieve earlier information, get faster feedback. So here again, we're looking at the tasks in our system, some common impediments to fast flow beyond the queue delays. We added a few things to the picture, the notion of a blockage, which prevents a task from moving forward. Uh, there's tasks that sometimes slip through the cracks, especially if they're not visible. You know, basically, if every day we have a critical task stuck in one of these places, is a delay is a day we're delaying the end of the part project. So, as project managers, in a traditional mode of updating tasks and plans and priorities once every week or two, we basically get to see this snapshot once every week or two, but we don't get a live picture. Managers and team members basically run on information the way it looked yesterday or last week or the week before, essentially aiming at a moving target with delayed snapshots of where the target was before. You know, when the feedback about these issues delays, days go by, our projects get longer. 
What we need instead to keep the project moving is faster feedback. We need a more live picture of the current state of project and tasks so we can get these things cleared quickly. In order to be able to be the traffic cop, we have to be able to see the traffic as it is right now, not what it was hours ago or days ago. Same thing in order for managers and teams to clear the blockages and get the dropped handoffs back on track quickly, we have to be able to see the real status of these tasks quickly. And we can only achieve this by debatching our updates. So let's take a quick look at the process. The task and project status update cycle looks a lot like this. So when our tasks are up to date and our schedule completion uh, date is up to date, we can see whether we're late or not and we can know whether or not to change our plans. Whether we've changed plans or not, you know, changing task status, update expecting completion dates, uh, oftentimes changes our priorities, what's critical and what, what the priorities ought to be. And we take this and we update with, this, with our information on this what we do, what tasks we execute, and what, what, we, what we put our time into. And then we repeat the cycle. And we can repeat this cycle in big batches you know, every couple of weeks where the information in this system, the, the delay of information, averages at five days. The normal batch where we update weekly, you know, information is on average two and a half days old. And when we update daily, information on average is a half day old. And we get that live picture a lot more quickly. It's like driving with our eyes closed some of the time. Driving in the normal batch mode, maybe we open our eyes every five seconds. Driving in the small batch mode is we open our eyes every second. And it's really increasing the sampling rate. This is our control system here. We need to, need to increase the sampling rate in order to get better control over our system. I'm sure uh, many of you understand what I mean there. Um, we're running a little late, so I'm going to have to keep trucking. So um, task project status. You know, small batches basically consist of four important things. One is the frequent stand-up meetings. Uh, in order for good stand-up meetings, uh, it's better if the tasks that you're looking at in that meeting are up to date before the meeting. Uh, that allows the meeting to go a lot faster and allows us to focus on the issues of the day rather than the status of the tasks and whether or not that matters. Um, then generally speaking, to support that, there are weekly updates to the near-term tasks. We call that rolling wave planning. And uh, oftentimes, I guess depending on the type of project and how the team's running, there's often a week, still a weekly team meeting. It's usually less than an hour. It's very proactive and focused on how do we make our, what, what's our plan look like now and how can we make that plan better rather than looking at old news and what happened over the last week and week before that you know, we have to get caught up on. Uh, one quick look at uh, daily huddles before we get into decentralized planning. Um, there's a lot of other benefits to them, certainly fast feedback, short blockages, fast handoffs, clear priorities, discourage multitasking, that's all stuff we've talked about. But there's also the impacts of teamwork and the, the effects of co-location that we get. So there's a sense of urgency if every day we're kind of looking at where you are with that task and how it's coming along and what we can do to help you get that done sooner. You know, that produces a sense of urgency that results in shorter tasks, faster tasks. Produces a cadence, keeps the team moving at a, at a fast but sustainable pace, and it keeps our project boards up to date. And if, in the case of Playbook, where our project boards integrated with our plans, it keeps our plans up to date, too. You know, checking in on it every day helps uh, incentivize the team to keep it up to date. But that all brings us to the key you know, six key principles, the concept of decentralized project planning and management. Really, the centralization strategy is very similar to strategies on the battlefield, where generals establish some general goals of the operation. The decisions in the heat of the battle are made by the people who are on the battlefield. You know, but not requiring the people on the battlefield to constantly deliver information to some central commander and wait to receive the orders back, the operations are more successful. And the same conditions result can be reproduced in project management and product development. You know, usually the centralized approach is there's one project manager has to change down each, chase down each of the core team members, figure out where they are with their tasks. You know, it takes an hour or so of the team of the, of the resources time 
the, the team members' time, takes many hours of the project manager's time. And we end up with a project schedule that's almost always out of date. And not to mention it's limited to a few hundred lines because that's all one person can manage. Each of those lines is a week to three weeks long and has a bunch of subtasks hidden in it that we really can't see and can help manage better. There's a million, million reasons why you know, one person owned projects and centralized project management is bad, but let's move on to what the better solution is, decentralized planning and execution. It's really all we have, all that we need for decentralized planning and execution are clear goals, good guidelines, and the information the team needs to make good decisions. So um, in order to get this, certainly you know, decentralized project planning hinges on the fact that the people who know the work are the ones who are putting the work into the system. And that helps with the accuracy. It helps get commitment by the team members who are creating their own tasks much more. In general, the project manager gets to play the role of integration engineer or system engineer of the plan. And the little activity owners, you know, the core team members, or the component engineers of the plan. And the project manager pulls the pieces together and helps balance the system. Uh, in general, rolling wave planning is absolutely required. That's the concept of we don't put a bunch of detail into tasks that are in the far future. Where we don't that detail doesn't necessarily pay us back. We do put the detail in the short term. We get good granularity in the short term where it does pay us back. Um, also, each person does a little each day rather than one person doing a lot every week. And again, all of this requires management support. We've got to have managers who um, support the engineer spending a little time on updating their plan or updating their tasks. So really, it's all good. You know, basically, you save the project manager a lot of time. He gets to be proactive, find ways to make for better make a better plan and it doesn't cost the team members that much more time if any time any extra time at all so really the ROI is huge you know we get fast feedback it doesn't cost us very much we get a proactive project manager yeah it's just huge really even if we add out hours two hours a week yeah, I don't have time for that it doesn't it pays us back it's huge <laughs> Five five percent of time of the time that this two or three hours of our resources represents, we get that five percent back with more correct priorities and faster feedback. We get it back five times over. Anyway, um, just a couple more things to touch on. Um, there are a lot of benefits to task granularity. Task granularity is something that's enabled by distributing the responsibility for maintaining things across more people. And there are a lot of benefits to that. We can find the pieces of the work that we can move to somebody else, some other resource, or decide not to do if we can see the pieces. Uh, we can see when an activity is taking longer or going faster than we expected, and so we get more accurate completion dates. We see progress. We get more accurate work and duration estimates. We clear handoffs, which go faster. I find ways to debatch. And there's just a million um, other examples. And a lot of times we're even asked, you know, what's the point of granularizing my task if I'm just handing off to myself? Well, if you look through this list, really a lot of them apply. Over half of them apply, even when the resource is handing off to themselves. Yeah, it's and, and so yeah, granularity is great. It's maybe not so easy as we'd like it to be, as at least for the first time in to, to trying to, to think about these things. Fortunately, though, with a little bit of practice, people get pretty good at it. It doesn't take that long. And once you build up your library of processes with granular tasks, you can always just go copy from the library and get all the granules without having to put any time into it anyway. Um, one other note, you know, obviously planning is difficult for some engineers. You know, they don't see the point, things are going to change. But the point is not that it's going to be a perfect representation of what our project's going to do. It's not a perfect model. It's a risk mitigation. It's the way we kind of pull forward information 
go forward in the process into earlier information and decisions about who's doing what, what are we going to do, and uh, what do we need to do it. Make all this, you know, it's basically earlier information, which means more to us rather than waiting until the time comes and dropping the ball. We know where the handoff's going to be. All right. Um, so I think I've got ourselves enough time for discussion. Um, oh, that's right. I was going to touch on a couple of things. So just a couple of pictures of Playbook and how we do this in Playbook. Um, one of the aspects of good uh, distributed just, uh, planning and upkeep is visibility to when somebody's done their update and when somebody hasn't. So that's very easy to see in Playbook as well as other great things that make for great daily stand-up meetings or daily huddles. Cues, visible loading, you know, the tasks in the context of the overall plan gives us good impact of change. Uh, you know, tight integration between the plan and the tasks themselves, and easily granularity. All good stuff for great huddles. Also, it's easy to decentralize. Uh, ownership is very clear. It's very simple software anybody can learn and use. It's really accessible from anywhere, anytime, simultaneously. You don't have one person allowed to change it at any one time. Uh, there's visibility and accountability to what's happening. You know, we can see who changed what, and so we get to see uh, what happened? We don't need to restrict people and control what they're allowed to do when we can see what they've done. It just doesn't happen. People don't break it. And, you know, really it provides the information the team needs to make good decisions on their own. We get to see priorities. We get to see loading. We get to see visible blockages. We get to see the impact of change. Everything the team needs to really make a lot of these decisions themselves, make the decisions correctly themselves. Okay, so just real quick summary, uh, reducing information batch sizes gives us faster feedback. You know, we can quick, more quickly adapt to the changing conditions of NPD. Gives us faster projects, more confident completion dates, less variability. We get more up-to-date plans and project status. Gives us more correct priorities. The list goes on. And really, decentralized project managers are a key enabler. You know, it's what enables us to have small information and update batch sizes. It gives us manageable views. It gives us more accurate plans. It gives us a lot of things, which also help to both give us a better model for our project and give us more control over the system and the outcomes of that project. All right, so just a quick comment on Webinar 4. We're going to get into not project risks, knowledge gaps, what they are, why they matter. We're going to talk about how to learn quickly, how to close those gaps, and mitigate those risks very quickly by, again, incorporating small batches. And we'll talk a little bit about architectural mitigations, things we can do from an architectural standpoint to help manage risk. OK, so at that point, looks like we have five minutes left for a little bit of open discussion. Any more questions? Um, let's go ahead and open up the lines to anybody who'd like to share really anything about what you're doing to debatch things in your development cycles or any other any other questions there are. Eric, there's one in the queue already. Um, we'll start with that. I think there's probably some history behind this question, but they said, uh, do you find it difficult to get engineers to plan? Uh, well, yes. I'll just say it's it's you know not ice cream <laughs> for engineers. It's uh, you know it's more like exercise. You know? and ultimately, there there's a lot of benefits you know, when, when you have the right system and and there's enough benefits for the engineers. They're willing to put the time in. In the case of playbook, what the engineers tell us is they don't once they see it and and they see how it works, they're okay putting the tasks in because that gives their managers great visibility to how loaded they are. And they like that. And there's you know, a number of other things, clear priorities, the ability to kind of move work around other people, more recognition that uh, who of, who the critical resource is and who needs to, 
to get the time they need to get their work done. All that stuff, once the engineers start getting that stuff out of it, they don't mind the planning. Any other? Anybody uh, have any other questions or examples where you, you did some debatching in okay. your system and that really helps you out? Eric, one of the one of the areas that we struggle with is uh, the notion of granularity. Uh, since, especially at the front end of the project, when we're when we're trying to solidify a concept, there's so much feedback coming in from so many different directions that planning becomes uh, very quickly a wasted effort. And we try to we try to lay out to any level of detail granularity the entire project. Yeah. Uh, we just know we're wasting our time. So yeah. uh, is, I am assuming that the rolling planning that you're talking about is kind of the cure for that, where we only have near-term targets to any level of granularity. Yeah, it's it's part of, yeah, it's definitely part of the solution to that. When it's early and we're in very much risk mitigation, conceptual exploration phase, um, what we find is it's, it's you, you maybe transfer what you think of as a task from being the action and the mitigation to being the question you're trying to answer. Or the other, you take it up a little bit of a, 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 a little bit higher level so you don't necessarily have to map out all the, the path to the answer necessarily. You just map out what question you're trying to answer and you granularize really in different ways and you break things down a little differently. And that's another example like when engineers are doing a design of a subsystem. And they're like, well, I can't granularize by part. I can't take this part out and just work on it and then work on the next part. It doesn't work. There's too much integration in my subsystem. And so we have to granularize in different ways. We say, well, let's work on this interface. Or let's work on this question. Or let's work on this problem. And we granularize in different ways, in different phases, in different types of uh, activities we granularize in different ways. It's not always this task, that task, and the next task, because we don't always know what that looks like. Does that help? Does that sound yeah. good? Yeah, that's, yeah, thanks, Eric. Okay, sure. Any more? Well, we're down to a couple of minutes, so let's go ahead and just go on to the feedback poll. And we thank you again for attending today and look forward to talking to you again next week. Lisa, can you fire off the poll? Thank you so much, and um, if you could just quickly answer the poll, we'd really appreciate it. Um, I will make sure that we get an email out with the part one, part two, and this part um, with links to the webinars that you can view on demand, and please feel free to share it. Um, and we really appreciate your time. Thank you.